This is Rob Ryder on uh, Saturday, 12-12-2020. That don't happen very often. 12-12-2020. Uh, United States has SCOTUS standing, not state of Texas. That's what I'm going to explain in this video. And so, Army, put your ears on because I'm going to tell you all you need to know in five minutes to go tell somebody and tell them to go tell the Solicitor General, go file paperwork. And then I'll expand more because that's what I like to do about where all the facts came from. But this is really quite simple, so let's get into it. Uh, but first, I'm Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, United States Army Veteran, a.k.a. Rob Ryder. Email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. Right, no S's on the courts or records. Just courtofrecord, AOL.com. And then my phone number is 616-712-6179. So take a note, right, that's... State of Texas is a state of the Confederate States of America, right? Under the Confederacy, way back 1861. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, right? Texas, 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 not state of Texas, has standing as a state of the Union. And so uh, this little bit I'm reading from here, and, and uh, you know, it comes out the University of Texas' website, so... What distinguishes Texas from other states is a unique history as an entity, right? So what is the entity? Texas. It didn't say state of Texas, right? The proper name's Texas. Begin in 1824, what we now know as Texas, what do we know it as? Texas, 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 not state of Texas, passed through many iterations between 1824 and 1876. Texas was at times part of the United States of Mexico, an independent republic, a state within the Confederate States of America, and a state within the United States of America. The original founding documents that legally established the entity of Texas set forth the rights and responsibilities of its people, defined the scope and powers of the government can be accessed on the site uh, with related constitutional convention materials, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, how they did all of it in Texas. But at the end of the day, it's called Texas. It's not called the state of Texas. So, um, you know, there's only certain things that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over, and one is when there's a state involved. Well, the United States qualifies because it's the um, association of all the states. So, it, you know, whatever affects the United States affects all states. So, yes, the United States can be a plaintiff. And it has a guy called the Solicitor General. So, really, it should be, you know, we should be sending the Solicitor General for a plaintiff, United States, to the Supreme Court to file paperwork to say that uh, these other states, whoever they were, didn't follow the freaking rules of the Constitution, right? And if they don't cease and desist, you're going to send the army after them. But this is what it says uh, from Wikipedia then about the Solicitor General. The United States Solicitor General represents the uh, federal government of the United States before the Supreme Court of the United States. The Solicitor General determines the legal position that the United States will take in the Supreme Court. Oh, so, yeah, just determine them to be the plaintiff. In addition to supervising and conducting cases in which the government is a party, the Office of Solicitor General also files amicus curie briefs in cases which the federal government has a significant interest, right? So the United States can be a party to a case in the Supreme Court. And uh, I'll show you where they, you know, they actually show it. It's it's on their website. The Office of Solicitor General argues on behalf of the government in virtually every case in which the United States is a party. So make the United States the party. That's the problem, right? They're trying to, so this thing that isn't part of the United States is trying to open a case in the Supreme Court as an original jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court says we don't have any standing. Pretty simple. The you know, state of Texas doesn't have any standing because it's not part of the United States. It's not one of the states. Ah, blah, 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 and then about appeals and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's the Solicitor General that could go to the Supreme Court and open a case for the United States as the plaintiff against these other entities that aren't states either, called State of Michigan, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, State of Wisconsin, whatever the other one is that you know that they were chasing down here. Um, and uh, uh, you know, tell them that they 
violated the freaking Constitution. So continuing on then, all this has to do with Article 3 of the Constitution, which says, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils, and those of which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Well, they shall have original jurisdiction. And yet they tell state of Texas, you ain't got any standing. Then apparently they don't believe the state of Texas is a state. And they're right. And because this says ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, really Trump should be a public minister. I mean, he's the highest public minister of the United States. But unfortunately, right, through Esquire espionage, dirty tricks, sabotage, Spies, whatever you want to call them, but the Esquires, John Glover Washington, is a junior, I do believe it is, right? When he gave Trump the oath at the inauguration, he added Trump's name. I say, I, Donald John Trump. So that, I, Donald John Trump, that's what he said. At the end, he added, so help me God. And so he said, so help me God. And if you go look at the oath in Article 2, it doesn't have any place to put in somebody's name. When they want you to add the name, they put I with a comma and then parentheses A and a B, A dot B dot. Right? That's where your name goes. And it also says in the sixth article, you can't have any you cannot have a religious test. And obviously, so help me God, is a religious test. And it's not written into the text of the Constitution's Article 2, President of the United States of America, oath. Now, the other thing that's not in that oath is the, to support the Constitution. And the sixth article of the Constitution says you have to take an oath to support the, sixth, uh, to support the Constitution. Well, that would mean then that Donald John Trump needs to take two oaths. And, uh, you know, I've shown this many times. I'm going to show the documents. But I'm just warming up here. So that's what's going on, right? The wrong entity tried to open this court case, right? It should have been Texas. Now, the problem is a guy who's pretending to be the attorney general for the state of Texas. He didn't subscribe the oath required by federal law under Title IV, United States Code, Section 101. So he doesn't have any standing. He's not representing Texas. Right? He's representing this thing called State of Texas, which is, you know, that's an enemy of the United States. Confederate States of America is where State of Texas is from. Okay, let me show you what I'm talking about. Hang on a second. Okay, so, you know, a lot of this is coming right off of the University of Texas's law library website, Constitutions of Texas, 1824 to uh, 1876. So uh, the first couple had to do with them, uh, you know, with Mexico and Texas and so forth. And well, then they left that and they started doing other things. And uh, I wanted to show it here. It's just a little bit easier to show. So in 1836, they became the Republic of Texas, right? We, the people of Texas, in order to form a government, right? So they weren't attached to anything else. It was just called the Republic of Texas. 1845, the Republic of Texas acknowledged. Uh, their choice to, you know, make a choice of our former government, and they joined or annexed Texas to the United States. So now Texas is, you know, the United States. Or is it in the United States? It's sort of like, you know, I think more like a township being annexed its territory to a city. Right? It got annexed in. It became part of the United States. Okay. And then in 1861, they had the Constitution for the state of Texas. And now it's we, the people of state of Texas. Well, what's that about? But, right, together with the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. So this is when they left the United States and they went to the, you know, to the Southern uh, Confederacy. Then we move up a few years to 1866, and uh, we the people of Texas, right? Who is it again? Texas, Texas, Texas. What did they do here? Uh, Great Liberty. Did they go back to them? I think, no, I think they just became their own state, right? They're not talking about either. 
the United States or um, the Confederate Confederacy there. But in 1869, we the people of Texas. But now, you see this all capitalized, so I don't really know what that means. Here it's proper case. Right? Here it's, uh, well, now it's all uppercase. But this says uh, they're going back to the Constitution of the United States and the laws and treaties made there in pursuance thereof are acknowledged as the supreme law that the Constitution is framed in harmony with subordination there too. So, you know, it sounds like they went back to the, back again. Then in 1876, uh, Texas is a free and independent state, capital S state, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. All right, so not state of Texas, just Texas, which is a free and independent capital S state. So what is the proper noun definition of state as opposed to the common noun lowercase s state? You know, what's the difference in the definitions? But apparently there is one. My point is, the only place they call themselves State of Texas, well, I shouldn't say that, here's State of Texas here. But this is one where, yeah, they went back in. This one here, right, is where they, we the people of the State of Texas, a proper case, right, State of Texas, and it's in the Constitution of the, or it's combined with the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. So the wrong entity uh, went to SCOTUS to try to get relief, right? So basically, there's more than one entity claiming jurisdiction over the same territory. One of them is in the uh, Confederacy, and the other one is in the Union. But the one in the Confederacy is the one that went to the Union's court trying to get relief. And they said, well, you don't have any standing here, you fucktard. Get the hell out of here, right? They should have arrested him while he was in the building. He's an enemy of the United States. Okay, hang on again. Okay, so hey, give me a couple minutes just to go through some basic groundwork, foundational type stuff, so we can all be on the same page about what the hell Rob Ryder's talking about. Because, you know, you take it in little pieces and talk about it, that, that people, it just goes right past people's heads. They don't pay attention to the details. Now, this is what it says in Article 2 of the Constitution, right? The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Then why is it when Trump stands there, his seal says president of the United States? It should say president of the United States of America, if he had done it right. But he didn't. I mean, it's not really his fault, right? This was done to him, but it's the way they've been doing it for some time, where they're not taking the proper oath as the president to become the president of the United States of America. Right, so in Article 2, it says, uh, Before he shall enter the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. All right, a couple of things there. There's no place after I to put in his name. And so if you were to you know, look at this as you listen to Trump take the inaugural address given to him by... Uh, uh, Esquire John Glover Roberts Jr. All right, you would hear John Roberts or John Glover Roberts Jr. say, I, Donald John Trump. Well, there's no place to put that in there, so it was done wrong. All right? They, I mean, if the government wants you to put your name in, they put an I with a comma and then an AB. I'll show you an example in just a second, but there isn't one there, so he wasn't supposed to put his name in. Right? And then he had him say at the end, and then, you know, he said, so help me God. And because the chief justice is the one that said it, not just Trump on his own, then the chief justice made it part of the oath. So he gave an improper oath, right? That Trump didn't take the oath to become the president of the United States of America. And the other thing about this oath, then if you look, preserve, protect, and defend. It doesn't say anything about support. So just remember that, because now we'll go look at Article 6 real quick and see what it has to say. 5, 6. It says uh, the senators, 
and representatives before mentioned and members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, ALL, all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. Right? That word support isn't in the Article 2 oath. But no religious test shall ever be required. No, sir, help me God. And yet they did it. Right? I mean, that's just the way it is. It, it's a simulated legal process. So uh, Trump, you know, this is why Trump isn't a public uh, official where he could go open a case in the Supreme Court because he's not this president. He's not the Article II president. So let's see what else happened, though, with that information. Okay, a couple more things to add. So in the Treaty of Peace of 1783, it's talking about, uh, you know, the been pleased that the divine providence dispose hearts of the most serene, most potent King George III, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, Duke of Brunswick and Lewenburg, Arch Treasurer and Prince Elector of the Holy Roman Empire, and of the United States of America. Right? There you go. He's the present. Here, I believe they're using this as a term, right, where he's claiming jurisdiction over this thing called the United States of America. Not the United States as a proper noun and America as a proper noun, connected with the word of, but as United States of America as the title of something. So there you go, but he claims United States of America. Okay. Now, 1 Stat 23. This is the first act, first law passed by the first Congress after the ratification of the Constitution. An act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain oaths. Right, so this is when you know they built the structure called the Constitution, and now they're going to flesh it out. And this is the first law they passed, being enacted by Senate. And why, whatever they put the brackets around the House of for, representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the oath or affirmation required by the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States shall be administered in the form following to wit, I, A, B. Do silently swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Well, look at that. There, they want you to put the name in. That's what the A and the B is for. Right? Not the way they did it in the second article for the president. Just I, you know, keep on going. No, I, Robert Allen Wartlewski, do solemnly swear that I'll support the Constitution of the United States. And there's that all-important word. This is the oath that supports the Constitution. It's quite clear. This They said this is the oath to satisfy the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States. And if you didn't take this oath, it doesn't matter who you are. You have no authority in the United States. And yet you're ramming the shit down our throats. Right? Now, this later was codified in the United States Code, in Title IV, United States Code, under flag and seal and seat of government and the states, where it says in Section 101 that every member of a state legislature and every executive and judicial officer of a state shall, before he proceeds to execute the duties of his office, take an oath to the following, uh, in the following form. To wit, there you are, IAB, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Well, guess what? They don't do it. Go ask them for it. Don't, don't, no, don't. Don't go ask them for a copy of it. This is the thing that we're doing wrong, right? I say you get this exact page. It's got the little eagle, right? This came from the government printing office website. You have it printed off at the library where they did it, and you haven't put their seal on it to make it a public record. Because what this signifies is as long as this is in the computer, this is an authenticated copy of what the law is today in the GPO. Right? But if you print it out, well, now it's hearsay. But if the library prints it out and puts their seal on it, well, then it's still an authenticated copy. You know, on that particular date. That's all they can, you know, that's as good as you can give them. And so, you know, I, my suggestion is go look at the front of a library book and you'll see they do a seal on there and they put their initials whatever that is that's why that's what you need on their document that's what makes it a public record you can take any book from a library into the court a contract book or whatever read whatever section it is that you say that's what your story is based on and they can accept it as evidence because it's part of the public record but we don't do these kind of things we print shit off or we write it out ourselves or you know whatever 
And uh, so we're not following the laws of evidence, and all we ever put in is hearsay evidence. We're not putting in full proof, self-authenticating evidence. And if we're going to put in hearsay evidence, and so is an attorney who's supposed to be, you know, learned in the law and attorney, well, then he gets the privilege. They're going to go with his evidence. Okay, so now uh, it's just not the president, right? This is this is everybody in Article 6 of the Constitution it needs to take this. Right? So who did this say? The senators and representatives. Yeah, they got to do it. Members of the several state legislatures. Yeah, they have to do it. All executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states. Yeah, check, 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 check shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution. And then Congress wrote the oath and said, this is the oath we're talking about. Except nobody wants to pay attention to this. They want to act like, you know, it didn't fucking happen. Well, here it is. You know what happened right here? In the acts of the first Congress. So that means Congress has to take this. That's what it said, right? So you go and look on January 17th, 2019, which is not the proper day to do this, but it's the day they did it, of the Congressional Record for the House, right? So Congressional Record. Google it online. Go to January 17th, 2019. Search on the word oath. Or, you know, just go to page 8, 7, 12, and you'll see that after they adjourn for the day, right, we're going to stop for the day and we'll get back together tomorrow. They're going to act like they're sliding in these oaths of office of members and residents, commissioners, and delegates. Saying that the oath of office required by the Six Articles of the Constitution of the United States and as provided by Section 2 of the Act of uh, some, something or other to be administered, da 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 da, which is carried in uh, 5 U.S.C. 3331. All right, so this is the oath that's in 5 U.S.C. 3331, which has to do with the administration. And as you can see, they put the words, so help me God, in it. So this is not the oath that satisfies six articles. Right? They just made it up and said it is, right? But until this, until this law has been repealed and taken out of the books, it's still the law. And it says, no, this is the oath you take. And it's the same oath that's supposed to be taken by, you know, your governor, attorney general, all the judges in your state, all the attorneys in your state, anybody who has to take an oath to support the Constitution. Actually, anybody who needs to take the oath um, that's in your state Constitution would have to take this oath. And this says before they can proceed to execute the duties of his office. So if you're going to court in a foreclosure or a tax case or you know whatever the hell reason you're going to court, those people don't have this oath, so they're not the government. It's just part of the big lie we've been told, right? And that's what's being pointed out now that, uh, you know, that all this shit's coming to the surface. And so let's look at what's going on at the Supreme Court right now for some clues about what that is. Hang on a second. Uh, just before we get to the Supreme Court. Uh, Solicitor General of the United States, he's a flagged officer, just like a general. Go figure Right, so is uh, you know the United States Attorney General. They're both flagged officers, and flags are all under this uh, Army Regulation 840-10 flags guideline. Streamers, tabards, and automotive mobile and aircraft plates. And uh, I have to go read more about what that could mean in here. But you know, the one thing it does mean in uh, this Army Regulation is in Title or excuse me, Chapter Two. So they call it Chapter 2, Flag of the United States, right? That's what this is all about, just Flag of the United States, which there's two styles, one with gold fringe, one without. The one without gold fringe flies outside. The one with gold fringe flies inside, uh, unless it's being used in a parade, right? So, the, you know, but they're both flags of the United States. And flags of the United States, they're official flags, and other than educational places, Right, they're only supposed to fly in military places, and the military does consider, like Michigan, to be an installation, an uh, army installation. You know, so that's all how she works. But I did want to point out that the 
National flags listed below are for indoor display and for use in ceremonies and parades. For these purposes, the flag of the United States will be a rayon banner cloth or heavyweight nylon trimmed on three sides with gold and yellow fringe, two and one half inches wide. Goes on to tell you the sizes, and then it says where it's authorized for indoor display. The flag of the United States is authorized for indoor display for each office headquarters organization, authorized positional color, distinguishing flag, or organizational color. Organizational battalion size, right? Military offices, military courtrooms, Army elements, subordinate elements, the U.S. Army Recruiting Command, ROTC, senior executive employee, or permanent retention. Uh, in other words, you know, all has to do with military. It's not for, you know, nope, it's not playtime. So if you see a gold fringe flag in a courtroom, well, that's a military courtroom. It didn't say it could be in a civilian courtroom. It said military courtroom. Uh, you know, if you're looking for signs, they're just all over the place. So let's get back to what I wanted to show you. Hang on a second. Okay, so if you've never been here before, it's Supreme Court of the United States website, and um, they got a, what is it under docket uh, case documents document docket search, right? And uh, well, it ends up being two two o one five five. It's a O. It's for original, right? It's twenty two with an O, and then one five five. That was this case, Texas plaintiff versus. Pennsylvania at all, as they called it. And this is the one that just got shot down by uh, where are you? Right? It said the state of Texas. Right? It didn't say Texas motion. It said the state of Texas. For leave to file bill of complaint is denied for lack of standing under Article 3 of the Constitution. It's because it's not a fucking state. It's really that simple. Um, so then we go down and look, well, who's the party name? State of Texas. No, nope, that's not right. Party name, state of Georgia. No. Nope. Party name, members, party name, lieutenant governor. Did they ever make the United States a party? Let's see. Oh, dear, dear, dear me. I just want to look at party name, Democratic Caucus, party name, New California State, and New Nevada, and New Nevada State. What are those? New California State? What party is that? <laughs> New Nevada State? Ow. Oh. Well, there's, that's kind of telling. Uh, anyways, right, this is uh, the game they played. And... Uh, if we look at what they were putting in, right? So this is their affidavit of service that they had served people they said they were going to serve. Sure enough, they said they're doing it in a state of Texas. Like versus Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, state of Georgia, state of Michigan, and state of Wisconsin. Well, none of those are the proper names of the states of the union. It's just Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, or Wisconsin. And... Uh, what was this? Okay. Uh, this is the motion for leave to file a bill of complaint. Where Ken Paxton, who didn't take the oath in 4 USC 101, is pretending to be the Attorney General of Texas. Well, he could be. if You know, he could have been elected and taken the office, but he didn't file the proper oath, so he can't perform the duties of the office. And him doing the oath for Texas isn't enough. He still has to do the one that's in Title IV United States Code 101, because that's the one the federal government requires. It doesn't care what your state does. It cares what you do for it. That's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Well, you can take your damn oath to office, sir. And, uh, yeah, is this the same one? No, this is a different case now. Anyways, I had found this one document. I want to find it again. That, um, you know, because... Uh, as you go in and you start taking these numbers off, you can go back and find these other original cases. So 220155 was not the first original case in the Supreme Court. So if you keep going back on numbers, you can find other ones. 
But there was this one that I think it was 150. I think that's why I have it up there. That um, I mean, it's like uh, uh, Justice Th uh, Thomas saw this coming, right? Because this is from this year, 24th of February, 2020. Supreme Court of the United States, Arizona versus California, right? But they're uppercase. They're not proper case names. These are uppercase names. A motion for leave to file a bill of complaint is denied. Justice Thomas, and with whom Justice Alito joins, dissenting from denial of motion for leave to file a complaint. Today, the court denies Arizona leave to file a complaint against California. Although we have discretion to decline review in other kinds of cases, we likely do not have discretion to decline review in cases within our original jurisdiction that arise between two or more states. The Constitution establishes our original jurisdiction in mandatory terms. Article 3 states that in all cases in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In these circumstances, we have no more right to decline the exercise of jurisdiction which is given than to usurp that which is not given. Our original jurisdiction in suits between two states is also exclusive. I have previously explained if this court does not exercise jurisdiction over controversy between two states, then the complaining state has no judicial form for which to seek relief. Uh, denying leave to file a cause between two states or more states is thus not only textually suspect, but also inequitable. Two or more states. So the United States is all the states, right? That's why the United States can just go and say, well, I'm coming for the United States to say you violated our Constitution. The one that all the parties signed to. The court has provided scant justification for reading shall to mean may. It has invoked its increasing duties with the appellate docket. Internal quotations and structure as appellate tribunal. But the court has failed to provide any analysis for the Constitution's text to justify our discretionary approach. It's because it's not the thing that's in the union. Justice Thomas, I know you know that. That's what you're saying. It's, dude, state Texas ain't the right entity to come to our court. Although I applied this uh, court's precedents in the past, I have since come to question those decisions. Arizona invites us to reconsider our discretionary approach. And I would do so. I respectfully dissent from denial of lead to file a complaint. So, right again, he's talking about state of Texas. Now, the thing is that in this particular case, now if we go back, that was 150. And we look, and we go down here far enough, we should see where they made the United States a party. Where in the heck is that at? A uh, solicitor general is invited to file a brief, in this case, expressing the views of the United States. And, uh, right, amicus briefs the United States. Well, let's take a look at that. What did the United States have to say? All right, he called him state of Arizona plaintiff, state of California. All right, he didn't call it Arizona, California. Uh, statement, discussion, conclusion. Blah, 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 for never got to anything. Uh, this brief is filed in response to an order of this court inviting the Solicitor General to express the views of the United States. It's the view of the United States, the motion for leave. Uh... File a bill of complaint should be denied. So, anyways, I'll have to read more into all these little things. I had just found this the other day myself. Oh, ain't that interesting that they have all these cases in here. And I had found one where he said that they should join. Um, but I don't believe that they asked him in this particular case to get involved. So let me look and see if they did. Hang on a second. Okay, so here's another one. This is 153, right? So it's uh, 
20.0153, and uh, it's the state of Texas and state of California. And again, the uh, uh, Solicitor General got asked to give his opinion or whatever to you know get involved, and he said this controversy warrants exercise of the court's original jurisdiction. Texas interests are sufficiently serious to warrant the exercise of original jurisdiction. So it's not talking about state of Texas. It's just talking about the thing going on between this entity called state of Texas and state of California affects the rights of Texas. So, yeah, it should be uh, heard at original jurisdiction. Um, one more thing. All right, well, I covered everything I wanted to cover. I can see, but I do want to go back over this. So this is what the Supreme Court Justice is saying, right? That uh, today the court denies Arizona lead to file a complaint against California, although we have discretion to decline review of other kinds of cases. We likely do not have discretion to decline review in cases within our original jurisdiction that arise between two or more states. Right. Well, the United States is all the states. So, right. So the United States, if it was the plaintiff, it could go against these other entities that aren't plaint that aren't states because it's you know a party to the uh, to the cause. The Constitution established our original jurisdiction in mandatory terms. Article three states that in all cases in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Then, if they Denied the case, that means state of Texas isn't um, a state. And the guy that knows, in fact, I wish I had shown this earlier, but it's the there's only one office in all the government of the United States that requires someone learned in the law, right? That's a requirement of the job, to be learned in the law. And that is the um, uh, Solicitor General. So somebody go talk to the Solicitor General of the United States and say you need to go file a claim for the United States saying that these other entities violated uh, the mandates of the Constitution. I'll leave the words to you, sir. You're the expert. You're the man learning the law. I'm just saying the United States needs to be the plaintiff. So how do we get them to be the plaintiff? You got that answer, right? Uh, don't call me. Call them and tell them what to do. And then call me and tell me what you told them. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Y'all have a great day, and uh, someday we'll get it figured out. We'll see you.